as I mentioned earlier, today is the feast day of St. Luke, so we are actually gathering for Mass on the feast day of the beloved physician. This is how St. Paul refers to St. Luke, his missionary companion, in his letter to the Colossians. And of course, we see today in our first reading that Luke is mentioned again, and given the way St. Paul talks about everybody else, it's in a positive way. He says, the only one, here, the only one with me is Luke. And Paul must have been having a, a pretty bad day because uh, you know, parchment was expensive in those days, and you didn't waste any parchment. And what does he do? He complains about all the people who've abandoned him and who've done him harm, and uh, he's not a very happy camper. But he begins to recover his equilibrium, and he says, may it not be held against them. So he's beginning to bounce back, and he says, and in any case, God has been with me every step of the way. Jesus has been with me. And I suppose we can uh, place ourselves in St. Paul's position, that we can have those same feelings, those same experiences, and yet we are, because of our faith, resilient enough to begin to weigh the situation more even-handedly and even thank God for being with us when others perhaps were not. St. Luke, uh, in early Christian tradition, was thought to be a Syrian from the city of Antioch. In addition to being a physician, we call him an evangelist for he wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, which means that this physician wrote about 25% of the New Testament. He was a very highly literate individual, a disciple of St. Paul, and probably came to believe through Paul's preaching. But what a career change to go from doctor to itinerant missionary, as well as uh, an inspired writer of sacred scripture. If we look at today's gospel, which is taken from the gospel written by Luke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is why you keep notes. <laughs> There's a butterfly up here. <laughs> I, th I take it as a positive sign. Uh, the gospel shows us what Jesus wants his followers to be doing and how they ought to be doing it. And we don't have to set out to, the, to far distant lands. This would be a restrictive view of missionary activity. You know, Mother Teresa had all kinds of people wanting to join her in Calcutta. She said, you don't have to travel 6,000 miles to take care of the destitute and the the dying poor, they're all around you in your home city. And that's what we realize too, as missionaries, our work is all around us. Because the church is a missionary church, and that means that you and I are sent by the Lord to spread God's word and to do God's work, as he would have us do. And the gospel is not something that we are to cling to as our prized possession, although in one sense it is, but we are to give this gift to others. We are meant to share our faith in the Lord Jesus. The Spirit will give us opportunities. So mission can mean many things. 
it can mean honoring and praising God right where we are. To pause in the midst of a busy day and say, all for your greater honor and glory, Lord. Thank you for your greatness and your love for me. It can mean thanking God for all that he has given us through Christ, his son. In a wider vocation, it can mean parents bringing their children to know and love Jesus. If we are young, it can mean caring for the old. If we are old, it can mean praying for the young. It can involve writing to legislators or healthcare executives when laws or directives violate Judeo-Christian values and the natural law. It can mean bearing witness to the Lord Jesus in our daily lives when the opportunity arises, and it will. Any deed performed in love can be a way of fulfilling our mission. The Christian mission, that's our mission here on earth. St. Luke certainly experienced what it meant to be commissioned by God. What a change of direction in his own life. And even though he was not a direct witness to the life and preaching of Jesus, he understood that from baptism onward, every Christian is called to mission, to respond to the Holy Spirit's promptings as the Spirit gives them. This realization expands for us God's grand plan for us who are his sons and daughters, for us who are the church. And so we must pray every day because prayer is listening to the Holy Spirit. Now, in addition to our prayers of petition and the own words that we voice internally to God, prayer is a two-way street. We speak, we listen. And we pray that our own words and petitions may not get in the way of this divine dynamic and that it is a duality, that we don't do all the talking and none of the listening. You know, it's interesting to note in the gospel that the very first thing that these 72 disciples that Jesus sent out should do upon entering a city, after eating what was set before them, was cure the sick there. What an important aspect healing was in Jesus' ministry. What an important aspect this was in the initial growth of the early church. Christ indeed is healer. Throughout the Gospels, we see how he heals. But he's healer of body and soul. The paralytic who was uh, lowered through the roof by his friends. The first thing Jesus says is, My son, your sins are forgiven you. That was the greater healing that was needed. And then later, so that you may believe that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins, get up. Take your bed. Go home. The second thing, of course, that the disciples are to do is to proclaim that God's kingdom is at hand for you. It's not just to proclaim that God's kingdom is at hand for you. And we can be a moment of decision for people. Who knows? Our Christian witness, our words, the 
practice of our professions can bring the kingdom of heaven into focus for others and enable them to desire it. So we are called after the example of Christ to be healers and heralds of God's great love. You and I, by our chosen life's work, are in an advantageous position to do this. Those who are ordained are doctors of souls. And all the rest, at whatever point in the continuum of care that is given to people, are also in a, in a position to encounter those who are not well. For those who need encouragement, for those who need healing. We come in contact with those who need to hear the good news of God's love as well as a healing touch or word. May God continue to give us this grace and the willingness to be that kind of missionary. And as I close, I would just like to say thank you to all of you. Also to uh, our priest here, healer of souls, uh, Father John Baptist at Spectrum and at Blodgett. who anointed many people with COVID, as did the Paulist fathers. No one has been more affected, no one has been called to work harder or more selflessly than you. And your families, your loved ones have shared in that. They have to try to understand, especially the young ones. As one who must deal with the vexing issues of masking and vaccines, I know that people are becoming more stressed and harder to interact with, even when you're trying to provide medical care. I saw a doctor this morning, and the doctor told me that she was having difficulty with an earlier patient who was angry because this patient had to wear a mask to come to the doctor's office. But the care that you extend, and I, I think about visiting the doctor today, the receptionist, the person who took me uh, to, the way to, to the room and took my temperature and my blood pressure and whatever else. The doctor and the resident who was observing how kind, uh, how interested, how professional they were. It means a difference. It makes a difference. It means a lot to me. And so once again, you deserve the gratitude of everyone. And I do pray for you. May God bless you and your loved ones as you continue with steadfastness and trust in God's providential care. <laughs>